Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Uh, gosh, our 10th year. I can't even stay with myself for 10 years. I don't know how you have. Um, today, our guest is Brandy Scalace, author of Dr. Humble and Dr. Butcher. Sorry, Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, A Monkey's Head, The Pope's Neuroscientist, and The Quest to Transplant the Soul, which was published in March by Simon & Schuster. And Brandy's previous nonfiction includes Death's Summer Coat, uh, What the History of Death and Dying Teaches Us About Life and Living, and Clockwork Futures, The Science of Steampunk. And I'll read anything that has the word steampunk in it. Um, She's been on NPR, written for Scientific American and many other periodicals. It appears that her upbringing may have led her to explore topics that are more memento mori than today's the first day of the rest of your life. So I suffice it to say that we've both been in a lot of basements, but in my case, my presence in some of them has not been willingly. Um, <laughs> we can chat about that further. So the Mr. and Doctor refer to a medical genius and pioneer who almost all of us have never heard of. And as the author tells us, it's a story of, in the, um, in the author's note, it's a story of curiosity, desire, daring, and dread, which sounds to me like a cross between Poe's The Raven and Vincent Price's Theater of Blood. So obviously, as I said, it's a must read. And not to frighten anyone away, I perforce must add, given the season and our emergence from our burrows, that it's the perfect beach read. <laughs> like if you read just one book this summer, read Dr. Butcher. <laughs> So anyway, without blathering further, as I usually do, welcome, Brandy, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, thank you. So first, as a bookseller, and all you listeners know I do this a hundred times, titles and covers. Now, you can't <laughs> judge a book by its cover but, uh, or title, but every single one of my customers does. And it's impossible not to buy this book, assuming you're a very strange person. And I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> hey, I'm the host of the Peculiar Book Club. I don't take that wrong. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're well, weird, so... your family. <laughs> okay, that works, works for me. Um, well, since I mentioned it, I don't know if you do, but do you have the book in front of you? Um, you know, wouldn't it just be that I don't think I do? Wait a minute, I think I have. Uh, yeah, plus you've connected to your earphones. So let me see if I have. Uh, this is so silly. But yeah, I do. Hold on. because But I only have the Kindle one. I think it's the same um, across all formats. I actually had one in my office and I gave it to someone. Oh, there we go. There it <laughs> yeah. Goes. So the reason why it's so good, and we'll talk about it, is that it's, it's a great color. It's a great cover. And there you have patient A and patient, <laughs> patient B, B. <laughs> one of whom is going to survive and the other not. So talk a little bit about that author's note because, and, and I've, sure. I've heard you do it before because it's basically, your whole book is based on a shoebox. Yes, and a bloody notebook. Um, it is, it's a peculiar origin story. I, I've never had um, a situation like this myself in, in, my, in my own life before. I'm sure it's happened to others, but essentially um, I didn't go hunting for this idea. This, this idea came after, came after me. Uh, I had written, as I said, as you were saying, um, a book on death and dying and I had gotten to know a neurosurgeon who did a lot with trauma and brain death. And one day out of the blue, he called me down to his office and he said he had something to show me. And this is Case Western Reserve Campus, uh, University in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's part of the university hospital system there. So I go down, it's a very old, beautiful building called Lakeside, um, you know, big stone architecture, pop inside and sit at his office. And he pulls out a, a shoe box and it's a it's sort of battered looking and he pushes it across the desk at me. And um, he doesn't tell me what's in it. So it's, it's, you know, I'm just full of anticipation at this point. I open it up and inside is a notebook. And the notebook is clearly really old from the 1950s. It, it's an old MIT lab notebook with the graph paper inside. It's brown. It's got, you know, torn up edges. It's clearly been very well used. And I start flipping through it. Now there's cramped pen writing, pasted in notes, graphs, information about brains and mice and little rusty flecks, which uh, the, the neurosurgeon tells me is dried blood. 
And I just looked up at him and I said, what have you given me? Like, why, am, why is this thing? And he said, it's the lab notebook of Dr. Robert White, the neurosurgeon who completed the first successful primate head transplant in 1971. And I could hardly get my head around the original, you know, there's so many words in that sentence that just make you go, I'm sorry, head transplant, successful primate, 1971, how could this be? So that was how, that was my original introduction to uh, Dr. White and this peculiar story that seems to have been forgotten by history. Yeah, it's like when I first saw, saw the title and then read your note, I thought, okay, this is going to be a science fiction book. <laughs> Because I also, no, no one's ever done that. How could they do that? And then also, since you've used the word peculiar a couple of times, actually three, if you talk about your club, you say again in your author's note that peculiar tales are often the truest. Mm. And that really works. Even, well, it always works. And that <laughs> the most haunted and fertile story ground lies inside the human mind, which and I will get the doctor or I, I tend to go around. Um, but that conveniently leads to the Cartesian duality. You're talking mm -hmm. about the mind, the Catholic church in this sense, and yeah. the seat of the soul, which he ponders and mm -hmm. he thinks about a lot. So it's, is the seat of the soul a kind of a movable feast? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before I get, before we get into the book proper, talk a little bit about that concept about, you know, the controversy since Descartes about where the soul actually resides. Right. So for many, many years, I'm, I'm talking way back in history. I, I was, uh, I did a lot with the 18th century when I, and 17th century when I was in graduate school, there was this wonder, you know, what's the, where are you at? Where are you, your personality, your soul, where are you located in this body? And for a long time, and we've had different ideas about that. The gut was very important at certain points in history. Uh, the heart, the blood, many people thought that the, your soul principle circulated in the blood to the point that what they thought the most important thing in your head was were the ventricles. They, they didn't really think that the gray matter mattered <laughs> for a period of time in our history. And so, you know, we, we've been wondering how to find it, how to locate it. Rene Descartes thought that the soul was in the pituitary gland. And he thought this because he found he could find the pituitary gland in the human brain and he couldn't find it in other animals and he thought ah that that's the human soul then granted he just didn't know what he was looking for partly <laughs> but um but you know we want to find a location for it and this is especially true for someone like dr white who is is catholic deeply catholic ends up being friends with two popes kind of catholic big catholic and for him the soul is of tantamount importance that 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 your selfhood and personality and the soul and the brain to him are all the same thing and that is very cartesian because cartesian dualism is about you know that the brain is really the point not the body um as a matter of fact women really liked this idea they, they ran with this after Rene descartes they were like see we can be just as smart as men because the body doesn't matter um it didn't really work out for them unfortunately <laughs> they still weren't allowed to vote but th this idea of wanting to hunt down where the soul is and then wondering what happens to it in life, in death, what happens if the body outlives the brain? What happens if the brain outlives the body? So these are the questions that are being batted around in the 50, it's sort of starting in the 1950s and going all the way to the year 2000, as we're starting to study things like transplant surgery and brain death and you know, wondering where this fine and ephemeral line really is between life and death. Because it's much easier to say something is alive or that it's dead than to pinpoint that exact ephemeral moment when the living principle has stopped. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that leads me to a mean little macaque. I mean, if you drill down, okay, that's all ethereal, mm -hmm. theoretical. But if you drill down, no pun intended, kind of, if you drill down to the macaque and the, and we can talk about PETA later, but if you drill down to that macaque, that's where he begins to say, I can actually do this, which again, as you said, I felt, uh, no, that's not possible. Right. So talk a little bit about the procedures that he used. And then the other thing about the book that I should mention is some of the photographs and pictures. There's a little disclaimer. At the <laughs> I, I thought, okay, well, I can look at this. It's not going to 
kill me. But yeah, some of the pictures are a little odd and a little off-putting. But talk about that process because mm. the other part of the book where I thought I call it the Last Supper is when he perfuses the dog. Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's we'll get to that. That's a good. Yeah, one. let's get to that. Um, yes. So what I what I want to it's hard to kind of encapsulate all this. this is really um, such a, a different time. We're talking the '60s and the '70s. And our understanding of things was just blossoming. There was so much we didn't know and we were learning fast about the brain, about the body, about paralysis, about nerve endings, about all these things, and about transplant. We had just discovered in the 50s that it was possible to transplant organs out of one body into another body and, and they could live. And if we're talking about kidneys and you're doing that, well, we have two kidneys, so you could share one. But if we're talking about the human heart, you can't take a heart out of somebody and give it to someone else unless that, per that person will die if you take that heart out, they need that heart. But the heart ha still has to be beating in order to put it in the other body. So what is, where does that leave us? So at this time period, this fraught discussion was developing around when are you dead enough to donate your organs? And this idea of brain death comes along. They're like, well, if your brain has died, then you are gone. You're not there. Uh, your body's still subsisting on the autonomic system. And this, this is a concept we still have today and people still fight about it today right? Do we turn off life support? Is this person alive or dead? That is, that's what's happening at this time period. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't an out of the way fringe question that White was starting to ask. His question was, where is the life? What does that mean? If the brain is the life, and that's what we're going to call life, and if the brain dies, we can use the body, what does that mean? So the first thing he sets about doing is isolating the brain, the living brain, from the body of a macaque monkey. And I think most of us can picture a brain, right? We can, we think of it as sort of hovering in space. It's kind of cartoonish, it's a pink blob. But the idea of getting it out while it's still alive is so much harder to grasp. Because what you realize you have to start with, there's a living animal and that living animal has to stay alive as you're abstracting its most important organ out of its body. And the way he did this is he used another monkey as a life support system. <laughs> um, he used another monkey as a life support system and he had unplumbed its vascular system and was putting the blood into the monkey that he was gonna remove the body from, all right? So no longer getting blood from this body, but getting it from another monkey, you get down to the head. This is a monkey that's still alive. It's anesthetized, but it is living. And then you cut the brain out of that monkey's head and it's still alive. This living brain without a body is supported on a little platform with mechanism and nutrients and blood. And it is hooked up to EEG and it is still sending out brainwave signals. It is still tipping off that graph paper and you know making those peaks and valleys that prove that it is still alive. It's still metabolizing, it's still alive. The brain just outlived its body. What does that mean for us as people, for medicine, for science? What does it mean that the brain can outlive its body? Not to mention the fact that it's quite, uh, I found it rather disturbing. I had to watch footage of this. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a disturbing thing to see that you are abstracting this living organ out of a living thing and that it might still be in there. Yeah, and the mechanical aspect of it, especially early on when he didn't perfuse and he just had to work really quick like the Russian guy did. I mean, just the idea of, like, I don't know if an anastomosis, what is an anastomosis? The idea of connect. So he's <laughs> taking, he's, and then the circular cut around the neck is just, yeah, I couldn't believe this. And, yeah, and then he rough. keeps going deeper and deeper. And then he's hooking up the arteries to the other mm -hmm. arteries with little tubes. tubes. Yeah, little tubes and cannulas. And I, yeah, and that part was just impossible. To me. And then afterwards, for 19 hours, they're feeding him grapes and he's grimacing and trying that was to with, bite. yeah, that. That's why after he does the head transplant, the first one, it was just a brain all by itself, um, just suspended on a platform, and which is even weirder to me. Um, but that led, he, he tried to convince people that this was a living brain. <clears throat> Not everybody agreed. And so he to prove that it was really living, that's what he does, the head transplant. So the next time he does the surgery, he literally transplants the whole head onto yeah. that life support system. Yeah. And at that point, He's like, see, I can prove it. It's a living head. It opens its eyes. It blinks. It tried to bite him. It, they fed it. It, it lived for uh, up to nine days. So, um, and, and it's paralyzed. I, I think it's very important to, you know, they've severed the spinal cord. 
this is this is a head. It's it it is it has been transplanted onto a body, but that body is a life support system. It's essentially just a head that is alive. And um, how do we feel about that? I mean, it's 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 peculiar. It's gritty. It's difficult, uh, particularly for animal lovers. I mean, I think it's difficult for anyone to to see that kind of um, performed on uh, as particularly our nearest evolutionary relative. But at the same time, he was trying to show. You know, if you're asking the question, is a body dead if there's no brain signal? Another way of answering the question is, if there's brain signal and only brain signal and no body, are you still alive? So he was sort of asking the brain death question in reverse. And when he performed that first transplant and the monkey opened its eyes, he said in the lab to his you know, colleagues and compatriots, have I reached the point where I can transplant the human soul? So for White, from the very beginning, this had dimensions that were both practical, pragmatic, surgical, scientific, and spiritual. Yeah, and the funny thing is, again, still having a suspension of disbelief in order to <laughs> read this, um, the idea that the, the main aspect of why there isn't complete efficacy with regard to the transplant is the fact that the spinal cord can't be reconnected. And so even right. if the brain survives and can manifest things, it'll never, it's, it'll be paralyzed from the mm -hmm. neck up. Right. And so then I thought, well, if he had already isolated a brain and this is right out of the movies and you even equate movies and the X-Files yeah. uh, to things that he was involved in. He was uh, consulted. He was consulted for the second X-Files movie by Frank Spotnitz. Yeah, which juxtaposes with his idea of Mr. Humble, especially he I <laughs> wish to get the Nobel Prize. Um, yeah. That, that yes. was the nickname he gave himself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Humble. And, and tongue in cheek because he had a great sense of humor, right? He did have a good sense. He The kinds of practical jokes this man pulled are remarkable. Worth reading the book only for the cow brain incident. <laughs> yeah. And also dressing up as Dr. Frank. Dr. Frankenstein carrying around the, the medical bag that way. Yeah. And jumping around like I do. I mean, the idea that he used Mary Shelley and the subtitle of the book, The New Prometheus, almost as a template for mm -hmm. what he was doing. That's kind of dangerous. I mean, it was a not silly, but it's kind of like, hey, wait, this is really not the way to go. He, he didn't think that Frankenstein was a cautionary tale at all. Like for him, Frankenstein was the hero of that book. And if you didn't, if Victor Frankenstein was the hero of that book, if you didn't understand that, then you didn't understand the book. Um, for him, pushing this, the barriers of science was important. And in fact, he saw it almost as a God-driven mission. Um, and I, I realized too, like when I talk about, the reason the book has got this title, the title is Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, A Monkey's Head, The Pope's Neuroscientist and the Quest to Transplant the Soul, is because there are two sides to this gentleman, right? On one hand, it sounds like complete hubris. Like you're comparing yourself to Victor Frankenstein, maybe not a good look for you. Um, you know, you're, you're taking the heads off of things. A lot of people were like, what's the point? You only usually do primate surgery if you're planning to do a human surgery. Well, he was. And we have to talk about the fact that he wasn't just a neuroscientist, uh, he was also a neurosurgeon. So he had a PhD and he was a neurosurgeon. And in the surgeon part, he dealt every day, like tens of thousands, like he said something uh, over 10,000 brain surgeries in his lifetime, um, where he was saving people's lives. He was taking out tumors. He was it, people who had suffered trauma. Um, he was putting them, he literally held one, um, a guy had been in a terrible car accident, had hit a tree and literally just sheared half of his skull away. And they rushed him to the hospital and Dr. White is literally holding the man's head together while they like, and they save his life. They do, he, they save his life and he ends up recovering, making a full recovery. He saw death and destruction all the time in his line of work. He, he used to go to mass every day after work, after his brain surgeries, because there's a lot to carry. And one of the things he also saw a lot of were people who, you know, were, their bodies were okay, but they had become brain dead. Um, to horrible, horrible situation where he tried to save a young woman who was hit by a drunk driver. And she became what they called a uh, non-responsive, you know, um, unrecoverable co coma, which is essentially brain dead. And he was so distraught by that. But he had other cases of people whose brains were in great shape, but they had become, you know, they were riddled with, with cancer or they had a neuromuscular disease or they had become paralyzed or all these other things. And for him, he thought, well, if the brain is good and the brain is the life, then shouldn't we do everything in our power to preserve that person? 
what if instead of giving them a kidney transplant or a heart transplant, and he was there for the first kidney transplant, he was at uh, the Peter Bent Brigham as a student when the first successful kidney transplant happened under Joseph Murray, but he thought instead of giving these people organs piecemeal, what if we were able to give you all of them at one time still in the wrapper of the body? So here's a person who's, he, he liked to use Stephen Hawking as an example. He's like, here's a, you know, an amazing brain or amazing head on someone. Um, what if we just gave that brain a different body? Yes, he'd be paralyzed, but he already was. So in a sense, it's like improving your life support system. By the way, Stephen Hawking was not interested in this idea. <laughs> he was not keen on it. Um, but White, you know, for White, he thought, why not? Why not? He's, and White even said, um, maybe Stephen Hawking's brain would work even better because we'd give it a young body full of young blood. And maybe that would, you know, who knows what he might discover. So that was um, his surgical drive and his sense that saving human lives was a, like a God-given mission um, is also pushing him to these, to these limits. And I think that that's important to realize because he's not just a sort of I just want to achieve science for science sake. He also has this deeply humanitarian understanding, it, flawed though it may be, and doesn't seem to include animals, um, about how to save children from cancer or how to save th these lives and, and improve people's lives. Um, and I think that's, that's fascinating because in a way, it means that he was perhaps less ableist than the medical community surrounding him because he felt that a paralyzed person whose brain still functioned was equally as important and worth saving you know, as any able-bodied person. And that's not always the way things work, so. And the thing about his surgeries, and like you said, thousands of them, yeah. if, you, if you distilled it down to one particular one, which wasn't, well, it would have been catastrophic. Yes, it was. Yeah. About the little girl whose yeah. uh, brain system was outside of her skull. Yeah. And talk about not being humble. He, these were what I would consider heroic measures. Yeah. And he just went in there, Mm -hmm. This little girl that he knew and knew the parents and was very kind to the parents. Mm -hmm. to talk about that procedure and how he just sure. jumped in there and did it. So she, she had had a condition where basically um, her vascular system, it was under the skin, but not inside the skull. It was like outside the skull, but under the skin. So the veins that are supporting your brain, instead of being in here, nice and safe, were running on the outside. And they weren't exactly sure how they connected in with the rest of her brain, but it meant that if she got hit in the head, even by something small, if she fell down, if all the sort of things that happen to a toddler, right? Because you're running around, um, she would just die because it would just be a contusion and a hemorrhage and that would be it. And so, um, and it was a bright purple vein. Uh, she had to sleep sitting up. If she laid down, it became taut and it like it bubbled up and it was just very dangerous. And she had been told by everyone, her parents had been told by everybody, this is inoperable. Like if we try to operate on her, she'll, she'll die. So, but her parents are like, but she doesn't have a normal life. She can't run and play. She can't do sports. She can't, she can't join the band. She can't do anything. We have to keep her like safe all the time. We want, we want better for our child. So White said, all right, um, there's no surgery for this. So I'll invent one. So he does. He basically, I mean, again, this is a big personality person, right? This is someone with a big personality. He says, all right, we will invent a surgery for this. And he had invented the perfusion technique already when I should have said something about that earlier, right. but uh, the brain is um, a greedy organ and it, it requires a lot of oxygen. And if it doesn't get it, it, it becomes brain damaged. So he invented a way of cooling, super cooling, hypothermia uh, techniques to cool the brain down, which meant you could um, stop the flow of oxygen longer. It's used today for open heart surgery. My dad even who had open heart surgery. So it's a very important technique. So he thought, all right, we're going to, he, he's looking at all these things and he's like, all right, what do I need to do to make this work? And he decides against perfusion, um, which is surprising, but he, he felt that it wasn't, it was too, um, risky and he, he goes in hot as they call it. And he develops, they had been working on this tool for the monkey surgeries that was like a, like a laser cutting kind of thing. It basically cauterized as, as it worked so that you wouldn't end up bleeding out and things like that. So they've got that in place, all these other things. And he basically preps her for surgery and they go in. And um, ultimately it turns out the situation wasn't quite as dire as they thought. It was easier to correct once they got in there than they originally- um, And he starts smi he smiles because he's so happy. Yeah, oh, he's thrilled. Cause he's like, oh my God, okay. Cause they weren't, part of it was, okay, once you have that, like how do you then get the veins back in? And they weren't sure how big the holes were in the, there's holes in her skull. 
but they were able to sort all that out. They actually filled the holes with a kind of substrate. It, it, was, um, it has like a wax in it. it you know, they did all sorts of things. These had never been done. This surgery had never been performed before. And, um, and she survived. She's a grown up. She still lives here in Cleveland. And um, I changed her name in the book because I don't want to give her press she doesn't want. But um, yeah, this is a hugely successful surgery from a surgeon who's just like, well, everyone else has said no, but I'll say yes, because I believe I can do it. Because that, because he did, he believed, yep, I'll, I'll be able to pull this off. So yeah, and it's like, it's so funny because, well, two, two points. And I think even though we're jumping around, I think we're doing a good job. of. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure you agree. Um, the, the other thought he had, which is intriguing, and mm -hmm. actually I'm surprised. Well, first, you do a really good analogy between inner space and outer space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, NASA started in 1968. Um, it's July 29th, 1968, because I love I loved NASA. But they still haven't landed anything on the land. Mm -hmm. And here comes Elon Musk, like Mr. Humble, and he's land, he, he landed boosters on platforms in the ocean, he's landed boosters on the ground over and over and over again. And so that got me thinking, okay, <clears throat> he's doing the same thing at the same time and, and inside rather than outside. And it seems like, you know, besides whack jobs like Sir, Sergio, you know, uh, Canavero and his now infamous YouTube talk, which I watched, he was, he's a, yeah, he was a whack job. And his, <laughs> his Stephen Jobs delivery and clothing, all that stuff. <laughs> but, I, but I stray. Um, so the one thing I thought of that could have been done, he talked about it. He talked about the concept of an isolated brain, mm -hmm. not connected to anything because that eliminates the spinal cord problem. And the idea of just the brain floating yeah. in whatever it needed to float in, he thought maybe that would even be better. Yeah, so this is a um, another one of his thought experiments, right? He has a number of those, but his point was, okay, you have a brain. Our brains are quite miraculous, amazing things. Um, White actually caused himself, called himself an astronaut of inner space, an astronaut of the brain. And you know, he says, it's possible that without all the distractions of sensory input, right? Because if you're just a brain, you don't have ears or eyes or nose or, you know, you're just a brain without all the distraction of sensory input, that brain might be able to think more clearly in a more focused way. He even said, um, perhaps brains outliving their bodies would be like supercomputers. Perhaps they'd be able to solve all kinds of problems and you know, influence the world in, the, in these various ways. And that does sound like science fiction, except, um, is it? I, I'm, I'm, I've been speaking with people who are working right now on decoding thought. Uh, they're, researchers presently trying to figure out how to program things for the brain so that if you're using a prosthetic device and you pick something up you can actually feel it because they're decoding messages back at your brain and if we're able to do that you know it does make you wonder what the limits of these technologies are but that's kind of the point of the book too is sometimes we get to the can long before we arrive at the should. And that can be dangerous because we start doing things without an understanding of what the ultimate consequences might be uh, of those procedures, of those breakthroughs. And so, you know, for White, he just saw this as something that we could do and that we would sort out the ethics of. But um, that's that's not a small feat. We, we were performing organ transplants before we had an agreed upon definition and criteria for brain death. That's kind of scary when you think about it. So you had some people going, yeah, I think he's dead enough. You know, you hadn't had some kind of, the, the Harvard commission on brain death happens after the first two heart transplants. So we want the ethics to sort of catch up and be there for these scientific breakthroughs. And sometimes a scientific breakthrough happens and then we go, oh, ethics, <laughs> we gotta catch up. So um, I think that's always really important. And it, it's so many more questions get raised. And the, the more research I did, the more I went, wait, what? So it was, it's that kind of book that's endlessly surprising the more, I un the more boxes I opened. Yeah, it's like, I forgot the name of the, I, mean, I used to know the name of the first heart trans guy because he was so nice. And he said, look, I'm doing this. I know I'm not gonna last but I'm doing this so later on people will be able to survive. And then I think again of Elon Musk, who I'm obsessed with, and the idea of him saying, yeah, we're gonna to go to Mars, but a lot of people are gonna die. And then everyone goes berserk. But that's the way it worked in your book. 
And yeah. that's the way it works in life. Well, the first heart transplant, which was performed by Christian Barnard in South Africa, um, the very first one he did was an accident, a woman who had been in an accident and had become brain dead. And so he, that was the first one. It wasn't terribly successful, but the second one he did was the one that caused his, the uproar there. And there was quite a bit of a blowback because he took the heart of Clive Hupt, who was swimming and had an aneurysm while he was swimming or basically a, a big a subdermal hematoma and a stroke. And he is brought to the hospital and he's appears to be brain dead. So Christian Barnard has a patient who is a dentist and he's a, a white dentist. Clive Hupt is a black man. We're in South Africa where there's still apartheid and, you know, uh, segregation. And he says, oh, okay, he, it's a match of blood type, but we're going to take this heart. But the doctor of Clive Hupt was like, I don't know for sure that he's brain dead. I, I don't know that we should do this. I, I think we got to wait. So they wait another day. Christian Barnard's like, come on, you know, this, this, could, this guy could go at any moment. So they agree, okay, I think he's brain dead enough. Um, and he takes the heart and he puts it in the dentist and the dentist ends up living for about 18 months after that. But it starts this huge uproar because everyone's like, you just, you know, you harvested a black man to save a white man. Um, and you weren't sure, sure, sure that he was really brain dead. I mean, it, you know, people got really upset um, and they said, that's not fair. You know, now his heart's going places that his body couldn't go because it's in a white guy. Um, here in the United States, uh, different African-American newspapers were all over this. They were like, oh my gosh, we're going to be harvested for white people. Doctors aren't going to try and save our lives anymore. They're just going to take our organs. So, you know, there was, there was a blowback. There, there really was. What's funny is what history remembers. Um, history basically goes, you know, Christian Barnard, heart surgery, woohoo. <laughs> and you don't get some of that, that other stuff. And so possibly the same thing will happen with Elon Musk or anyone else. Um, the successful people in history often get to write that history. And so it often looks different, um, you know, once you get to the future than it, than it does in the moment of tension that it's, that it's happening. But the same thing's true. Dr. White had all kinds of media and press attention, international attention, in and out of media. Um, he fought with PETA. He did public debates with Ingrid Newkirk, the founder of PETA. He was chased by people wearing gorilla suits. Um, from animal rights activist groups, that's a very peculiar story. And all the while, this was all in the news. But now that it's all over, most people have never heard about it. So I think it's funny what we what we remember, what we choose to remember, and what we choose not to remember about about these instances in history, um, particularly when there's big breakthroughs. And some of the, some of the parts, I'm not saying you have a bias, but it tilted me one way. It's like the debate with Newkirk and she's reading from note cards. You make sure you say she's reading from note mm -hmm. cards. Whereas he is this avuncular guy who's so calm and pleasant that when he speaks, it's clear that the audience is on his side to a certain extent. Yeah. He and was really good at that. He was yeah, fantastically, he yeah, he's, he was fantastically manipulative of, of audiences. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke at some length to Ingrid Newkirk before I wrote the book. Um, really? Yeah, I did. And she was saying, you know, she's like, I knew I was going there to get murdered. You know, I'm not, not literally, but she's like, I knew I was walking into a room that was completely stacked against me. This is his home tour. It was in Cleveland that we did this. So White not only was there among his town and his people, he stacked the deck. He took people he had performed surgeries on and, and planted them in the audience. So when he would say certain things during his talk, People could stand up and be like, and he saved my life. He knew exactly what he was doing. So, um, cause I asked her about it. I said, you know, it didn't look like it went particularly well for you. And she was like, I didn't expect it to. I wasn't gonna go to Cleveland and, and succeed. I knew that, but I felt like I had, you know that I had a duty to answer um, this debate. So it, it was really uh, interesting, but he, yeah he was fantastic. I mean, the man could talk off the cuff. There was no, faffing about with ums or uh, I mean, he just could talk it was fascinating people loved interviewing him for that reason he was just right there and he was funny and you know um tongue-in-cheek you know he called himself Mr. Humble he gave himself the nickname Mr. Humble uh he was called Dr. Butcher by PETA <laughs> but what kind of person gives him the self the name Mr. Humble someone like Dr. White who is just larger than life in many ways yeah and it's funny like when uh, he was giving that one speech and the woman came in and threw the bloody head that she yeah had. yeah and he it, he doesn't miss a beat he doesn't no. I, I would i that would just like i wouldn't know what to do and he just keeps on going he apologizes for the interruption <laughs> to the audience 
You know, yeah. like, I'm sorry that you had to see that, but let me carry on. <laughs> yeah, he had death threats and he was just like, Meh. I mean, the, the night that he was chased by the gorilla wearing costume people, like he thought it was funny. He was yeah. like, oh, it's like Planet of the Apes, you know. Um, the driver did not think it was funny. The driver was like really scared because they weren't sure there had been some incidences not with PETA but with a group in the UK where they had done some car bombings and stuff and so you know there was naturally a lot of tension um nothing like that had happened here but you know nonetheless you that's in the 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 background of your mind and White received death threats and and bomb threats at his house so you, you know it wasn't impossible that these were potentially dangerous situations nothing bad happened but the point was he was just you know like he just carried on and and some of this is it seems really true. I'm not just, uh, you know, there were rumors about what he was like, and I kept thinking I would debunk them, but instead he just kept being bigger than what the rumors were. He just had a real sense that he was always right. Well, I, and I want to come to that with regard to his meetings with the Pope and kind of like a <laughs> Venn diagram of his Catholicism. And yeah. But the funny thing I was just thinking about when you said that was, you know, all these surgeries, all these savings of lives, all of what he was doing. He did all this when he had 10 kids. Yes. He I had mean, ten, he had just ten, 10 kids children. alone. And so I, I, was, think, <laughs> I was thinking, I don't think his wife gets, gets enough credit. Yeah, I know. I was thinking that too. And then their little summer house and all that. But, but I was thinking though, just like a Russian dissident, that one, I can't remember his name, who was in, who's still in jail. Wouldn't he worry about his family? You yeah. Know, he, I would think. He, by the time the, the worst of this was, so again, times were changing, right? When he was doing these things in the 60s and 70s, you'd be surprised at how kind of okay people were with things. But after the raiding of the lab, uh, it wasn't his lab, but the lab yeah. in Silver Springs with the monkeys there, and, and they, it was revealed to the media how with the bad conditions that these lab monkeys were in, suddenly this became something the public was very interested in, but that's, that's later. So his kids were, most of them were out of the house by the time the worst of this um, backlash was happening. And that's, I think, part of why he had a little bit of a, I think he might've been more worried if he had very, very small children, but he didn't at that point. Um, but when he did have small children, the man was hardly ever home. I mean, he, he, what he did is his wife and he had kind of worked out this system where on the weekends, he largely took them with him and they went with him to the monkey lab and they went with him to the West Side Market in Cleveland and they went with him for grocery shopping and they had like four carts of groceries. I mean, these there's 10 children. Can you imagine 10 teenagers in your no. house? No. <laughs> it's insane. So, um, so they had that going on. He also took the children every year for a week to uh, the Breakers Hotel in Sandusky on the lake, on Lake Erie. And he did this partly, it was called uh, his wife's vacation. It was Patricia's vacation. <laughs> she sent him and all the kids like, go away. So they would go to the Breakers Hotel and he got them all shirts with numbers on them. Yeah. They're quite small and there's 10 of them. And he would sit himself on the beach and he would still be doing his research work, sitting on the beach under umbrella, he had a bullhorn and he would just shout periodically like, number two, you're too far out. Number three, stop hitting your sister. So that, that was basically how he parented at the beach while these children were running around. So, you know, the story is a personal story. It's not just a story of these weird philosophical content, uh, conversations. It is that. It's gritty in some places. Um, I, I think it, for me personally, I kept being turned on my head. I kept thinking, this is wrong. Oh, except, oh, but, well, you know, there's so many different aspects to everything, even his desire to perform a human head transplant is not as crazy as it sounds. I like the way that when he took him to the lab, he would say, watch out because they'll, they'll bite you. Oh yeah. They and the thing about the macaque is it's the same monkey that was in uh, a night at the museum. Yeah. <laughs> they are mean little sons of bitches. They, they, they're really um, robust. One of the reasons macaque monkeys are used in lab work is that they're very robust. They, they're hardy, they're not delicate or fragile. Um, they can be quite vicious even to each other. They usually um, have to watch keeping them together because the males will fight, obviously. They'll jockey for a position, they'll hurt each other sometimes. And at the time, um, you know, one of the things that does come out of the clashes between science and animal rights is the changing of the way they handle lab animals you know nowadays they um they actually have a lot more they're required to give them a lot more enrichment 
Um, and that actually makes them a lot calmer. So, you know, you had, the, they were meaner. <laughs> they were Part of that was just, they're in tiny cages. They don't get to run around. They've got all this pent up energy. So it, it is better now, um, the, the conditions for them are better. But White wasn't actually violating any laws. They're just, he was following the laws of the time. And they were, they were in relatively small areas and they were unhappy about it. And they really, really didn't like him at all. Like they, no, no monkeys liked Dr. White. <laughs> He was not, yeah, he was not, not their friend. Um, White did do experiments on other animals, on cats, on dogs. Uh, he had a cat that they removed a hemisphere of its brain, and then he ended up taking it home, and it became a house pet that they called Sidewinder because it walked sideways after the, after the surgery. So, I mean, it's a, the story is just chock full of things that would never happen now. Like, you'd never be allowed to do these things now. Um, you know, there's rules about what you can do with lab animals and you're not supposed to take them home and make them pets and things like that. But, um, you know, this is the seventies and eighties and, and things were really different. So talking briefly about his Catholicism, tell the story, because it was one of my favorites about inviting the priest and doing what he did with the dog. And <laughs> I want to say something about that. So I mentioned that White had a big personality and that he never, he always believed that he, he was on the right side of things. Um, and he believed that God was backing him in many of these ways. And so I just want to start off with that because this, this is a thing that's hard to, to imagine happened unless you're somebody who has that sense of how right you are about the things you're doing. So uh, hubris might be another word for it, but <laughs> he was again trying to prove, he wanted the Catholic church to agree that brain death was actual death that brain death equaled death, basically, period. And he wanted the blessing of the Catholic Church on this issue. He went to the Pope to inquire. Uh, the Pope kind of um, kicked the can back at him, was sort of like, that's not really our job. Like, our job isn't to tell you when, that's your job, you're a doctor. Um, so one day he invites a priest down to his lab. And when the priest arrives, he, he's supposed to be coming for lunch. So uh, when the priest arrives, White is there, and there is a dead dog on the operating table. And um, it has had all its blood removed. Blood is over here in a separate container in a vat, and the dog is hyper-cooled, and it's just cold and stiff, and it's lying on this table. And uh, the priest is not real pleased about seeing that. And then White takes out a picnic blanket and just starts having lunch, like there with the dog and him and his colleague, like they're eating sandwiches. And the priest is just like, no, <laughs> this is no. You know, I was the the account that I was given is that the priest literally doesn't even approach the table. He's just like, I'll just hang out over here by the door. I don't know why I'm here. So White says to the priest over his sandwich, um, you have to see a picture of White. White is a sort of balding, slightly chubby, big black frame glasses, pipe in his mouth, and he's eating a sandwich. And he says, uh, is this dog dead? And the priest is like, we, yeah, I get you sure? Yeah, I guess so. And he's like, are you sure? Are you, you sure he's dead? Yes, he's, he's dead. Do you want to perform last rites for the dog? And the priest is like, no, <laughs> but I mean, all right. Yeah, it's a dead dog. Why, why is there a dead dog at your table? So then White whips away the picnic blanket and he starts, he reverses the process. He sends the blood back into the dog. He warms the dog's body temperature back up and the dog wakes up, gets off the table, walks around the room, much to the surprise of the priest who has just declared it dead in the eyes of God. And White says, so is, uh, so, so basically what's happened here is the body, the body was essentially dead to your eyes, right? But the brain activity was preserved by being cold. Therefore, the brain activity is where the line is between life and death. So, um, you know, do you believe brain death is real death? Or did I just perform a miracle like Jesus and raise something from the dead? which is not a fair question to ask a priest. <laughs> but that's what he did to prove his point. He basically froze a dog to prove a point about brain death. Which again, I couldn't believe, thinking about it, I couldn't believe <laughs> the fact that he goes, look, just like Christ. Just like Christ, see? And so, that's you know. Right. <laughs> but it's um, so blasphemous. It is so blasphemous. And the, But yet, you know, he's a... Well, I don't know that you come out of the book thinking that he's either a hero or a villain, but that he's sort of a, uh, an anti-hero in some ways. He, he certainly does things that are amazing and laudatory. Really, truly, he was no, nominated for a Nobel Prize um, for perfusion techniques. We still use those today. They're highly important. 
he saved many people. And here in Cleveland, he's basically a celebrity. Like I can walk down the street today. He's been dead for quite a long, he died in 2010. I can walk down the street today and say his name and random people are just like, oh yeah, he saved my aunt. Oh yeah, I remember him. He did this, you know. Um, he was on television here. There's a, a Cleveland show called Big Chuck and Little John. And he was on the television show doing stuff all the time, like doing skits. It's like a comedy show. So, you know, he, he was all of these things and he was somebody who performed experiments on monkeys and who wanted very much to perform the first human head transplant. Or by the way, he called it body transplant when he was talking about humans. He called it head transplant when it was monkeys, body transplant when he talked about humans. And another thing he did, like, I mean, I, I mean, I can, I can barely, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. But I mean, you know, then he's standing on the corner, like the speaker's corner in Hyde Park, and he's giving out medical advice to all these people. Yeah. And then the one guy, the one guy with the headaches, he goes, he tells him just to change the brand, brand, brand of beer, of beer that he's drinking. Yeah. I he's mean, like, that's what your problem is. You're drinking the wrong kind of beer. I mean, um, I, I really couldn't believe that. But I mean, so he's just helping these people. Yeah. He just, he would meet people for free because they couldn't afford care. And he would just, you know, go be a... He wasn't a general practitioner, but he would go and basically be a general practitioner to people at McDonald's of all places. He would he yeah, set it. himself yeah. up at McDonald's and people would come to him and he would uh, he would meet their needs. I mean, it is interesting. He um, he's hard to 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 sort of pin down as a person. The the story about the human head transplant is still the one that I think said the most to me about what his aims were because. It is so easy to think he wants to be first at doing something because he just wants to be first. You were mentioning Sergio Canavero earlier, but at, he was actually approached by the patient. Craig Vitovitz approached Dr. White and said, I want to volunteer to be your first patient transplant, um, which might sound silly to us, but Craig was um, a tetraplegic person who had a very full life nonetheless. nonetheless. I mean, he, he was married, he had kids, he had a business, he lived like anyone else would live. Um, he was an inventor, but his kidneys were failing. And because he was tetraplegic, he wasn't considered a good candidate for um, transplant. And for him, he felt like, well, that's, it, that's as though you're saying my life isn't as important or as valuable as somebody who's able-bodied. And I don't think that's fair. And so he actually seeks white out. Uh, and White says, you know, yeah, let's see if we can make this happen. Let's see if we can get you a new body. Um, and that's a, a different way of looking at it. When, it. when someone who's suffering already and who says, I want to see my kids graduate and grow up and get married and I want to see my grandkids and the, the medical system as it stands won't let me do that. I'm willing to do an experimental surgery. That has a very different ring to it than this Frankenstein guy wants to create the first head transplant. Do you know what I mean? Um, it, yeah. it, it says something different that. to you. Yeah. Well, especially since you're coming into current times, I'm thinking. Yeah, this is a uh, 1998, I think is, or 1997 was when they met, I think. Yeah. And well, even other things like the lasers and all that, but I mean, he's doing things on the cutting, not to be, no pun intended, the cutting edge, <laughs> but the book idea is so hard because I say things like I can't get my mind around it. I can't I, get my head I know. around it. I know. Yeah, I have to, yeah, I did that all the time during <laughs> mind the mind blowing. Yeah, writing it down. And a lot of which I won't say. But the thing about it is, is that it seems like by now, especially in the chapter where you talk about bypassing the spinal cord. Yeah, it seems like now whether the it seems like it wouldn't be. It's not that it's easy, but it wouldn't be that hard to simply isolate the brain because there's so much we've accomplished mm -hmm. since 1968 that it seems like that would have been something that had happened already. And I don't think it didn't because people morally, although that's a big part of it, object to the concept, just like with stem cell research. Mm -hmm. But it seems like, okay, why has he did this? Why hasn't this happened one way or the other? Why? White really, White really felt that it was going to, but I think partly you need four things. If you're going to do a, a, a head transplant surgery, on a human, you need four things. The first thing is you need a willing patient. And you'd think that would be the hardest thing to get, but he actually got that. Um, the second thing you need is a donor. Remember, we need a whole body and that body still has to have a beating heart. So it has to, the autonomic system has to still be functioning even if it's brain dead, right? So you need a brain dead body donor and you're gonna take that body and you're gonna put that over here and give someone else's head to it. And there's a couple things we have to, and, and actually White had plenty of access to those too, but there's separate questions we have to ask about that. 
because it's one thing it, it's already hard enough for people when it's like okay my son's heart my son was in an accident his heart now beats in another person's body but you don't see physically that heart and when you see that person you don't see physical aspects of their body but if you're giving someone the entire body of your loved one and only the head is going to be different that you know it's does that raise different questions there's certainly questions that have been asked about face transplant for instance is it how disruptive is that going to be when you're literally using the entire outer bit that we normally see um and that's what you're changing you're changing this outer bit of the body so you need a, a body donor and on top of that if you're giving someone the body the whole thing that means that one person gets all those organs when that body donor could have saved a lung transplant, a heart transplant, a liver transplant, a kidney transplant, you know. So are you saying that that one person is worth five people if you're giving them the whole body? So there's all sorts of other ethical questions that have to be answered um, if, you're, if you're planning to do something like this. The other two things you need are a really large pile of money because it's like he estimated between like four and eight million dollars and that was back then. Back then, yeah. Um, so it's very, very expensive. And the final thing you need is you need a hospital that is going to let you do it at their facility and risk the public outcry, the backlash, because as with so many transplant surgeries, the first ones aren't always very successful. So right. if you do the first one and it fails or something badly goes badly wrong or whatever, then you're incurring all of that potential liability. So th those are a lot, th the reasons for why it doesn't ultimately go forward isn't as simple as uh, we think it's immoral. It, it's that there are like little ethical questions to answer all along the way. Who gets to decide that you get five people worth, you know, five transplant patients worth of organs? Who decides that that is okay to use that body? Who decides to put their money on this when instead of cancer research, who, you know, there's all these different questions to ask. Um, and that's not even getting to the biggest one in my point, which, or my opinion, which is if you're transplanted to, if you transplant your head, onto another body, are you really gonna be the same person when you wake up? Are we really just brains? Knowing that we have neurons in our guts and hormones that affect the way we think and all this other stuff, what are the, what are the consequences we haven't even thought of yet about being in a different body? You know, um, what if, uh, does gender matter? Like if you're a person who, you know, feels that you're a woman and now you're on a, a man's body, would that matter or, or doesn't it matter? You know, there's all kinds of other stuff that go into it. And so White felt that 100% this would happen within the next 50 years. And he said that in 2000. So he felt that by 2050, this was definitely going to have happened. But there's so many questions to answer before that can can happen. And then whether or not that the, that, that ought to be something that we spend our time and money on instead of something else is, is another difficult question to answer. Yeah, but what you're saying now, for the most part, is a moral and philosophical and metaphysical structure that precludes or theoretically precludes this. And, and you distill it perfectly when you say who gets the funeral? You know, what are you bear who are you burying? Mm -hmm. And that distills what you've just been saying. But my question not to beat a dead horse is, does beat, beat a dead horse fill into, does that fit into our thing? About <laughs> I don't even know anymore. But, but so, is the real question in my mind, is it feasible? Is, is it feasible whether you spend five or 10 or 20 million right oh, now? Yeah. Oh, you're capable of doing it right now. We could do it tomorrow. <clears throat> yeah, the, really? the technology's here. Oh yeah. Um, it's just that you need those other pieces, uh, those other technical pieces for it to work. Um, to give you a good example, actually going back to Sergio Canavero, he was trying to perform the first human head transplant. And he also had a willing patient um, and they were hoping to go forward. And then the patient changed his mind. Um, the patient suffers from a neuromusculature, mus neuromuscular degenerative disease. He's, he's uh, paralyzed, he's in a, you know, permanently in a wheelchair, all kinds of other problems. Um, his body is going to fail him eventually. And uh, essentially the, um, the doctor said, you know, all right, we're gonna plan this surgery. It's gonna go forward. They set a date, great, we're good. And then he backs out because he fell in love. He met a woman, he fell in love, he got married and he no longer wanted to take the risk. So when asked about it, they're like, well, you always knew that the surgery was risky. 
He says, yeah, but there's a difference between knowing I'm going to die someday, even if that someday is soon, and knowing I'm going to die on a surgery operating table on Tuesday. So, you know, I thought that was really poignant where it's like, oh, yeah, there is a in my other book on death and dying, I say once that there's a big difference between knowing you're going to die and knowing you're going to die tomorrow. Um, that's that's, you know, what's to say Craig Vitovitz might have changed his mind, too, when it came down to it. This is a big decision to make that you're going to go forward with something and you don't know what the consequences is. It is very similar to going into outer space. You think about those first astronauts who are willing to leave our atmosphere and, and go somewhere else, you know, go to the moon. The terrifying leap into the dark for humans is something we, we will take those steps frequently, but it's a big one. And, uh, and I'm just not sure that there are people really, really willing to do that. Um, and it's a personal decision that, uh, you know, it isn't to be taken lightly. And I'm not sure we'll ever actually get that. I think we're gonna end up with other technologies potentially first, technologies that fix other aspects before we get to this one. But technically, yes, we could do it. We could do it now. Yeah, and I was looking at it like, whether it's the Mayflower or astronauts or going to Mars or all the things that the risk is immense, but mm -hmm. the, the possibility of the gain is incredible. And that's the way he seemed to have looked at it. Mm -hmm. But, oh, and that reminds me, Oh, well, so we are, since we've mentioned it twice, you need to explain who Sergio Canavario is. Oh. If, you, if you look at his Wikipedia entry, it's so funny because he kind of trashes him, but it's also written in kind of this Italian English. <laughs> oh. You should really read it. Oh, it's, let's check it's, it out. It's truncated, but it's really funny. I've, so, I've, never, I've never spoken to him myself. Um, my colleague, the same one who put me onto this project in the first place, knows him and, and actually has worked with him some in the past because they're both uh, neurosurgeons. And... Um, yeah, he's done some good stuff. He's not an yeah. idiot. Oh, no, no. It, but he he's he ended up at odds with his uh, university. So he was at the University of Nice. And they ultimately parted ways with him. They were like, no, nah, you're a loose cannon. We don't want this kind of press. And so this, is again, gets back to that, the four things you need to do perform a head transplant is you have to have somebody willing to go, yeah, that that kind That's of really good, out, yeah. out there thing sounds good. Um, and uh, they're not, they weren't willing. I mean, when White I'm not even sure White would get away with a, a monkey head transplant today. Um, at the time that he did them, we were in the Cold War. And there was a real sense that, uh, and the, the Russians had been creating these two-headed dogs. They had been transplanting heads onto dogs. And so there was a sense in which, oh no, we can't let them win. You know, we got to do something. So I also don't know that you'd have, we're not in that environment now, you know? So I'm not even sure that he would have gotten permission to do some of the things he did do today it's hard to say or if he might have gotten permission he might not have gotten the funds you know the the national funding bodies might have been like yeah mm, no we don't want to do that so um anyway uh Canavero had been pushing to do this for quite a while he ended up at odds with his university uh he ended up teaming up with Dr. Ren in China who has been doing head transplants on mice and they're still doing some work together. Um, I know he's had to basically, you know, shelve his human head transplant ideas. He no longer has any willing participants, um, but he's still working. He's still publishing. I mean, he's still producing things. Uh, after I wrote the book, my colleague passed on a message to me from him. <laughs> um, he was, uh, I, I believe his biggest shock was that the book was written by, and this was in all caps, a lady. Um, so that says, some things about him yeah but he's uh, a very good guy he seems like he'd be fun to have a drink with or something <laughs> you know? he was he was really excited that i uh, that i'm also italian though that that pleased him so um anyway but no i've never met him but he he is still working on it he hasn't given up the idea at all i mean he was very adamant in his email to my colleague that like you know he's like this isn't over <laughs> so um we don't know what we're going to see in the future or where will happen next it's not going to happen in at the university of nice it's not going to happen at case western reserve university but that doesn't mean it won't happen. You mentioned the two-headed dog. And the funny thing about that picture is the little guy who's attached, he looks really happy and he's animated. Yes. And the, the big German shepherd is like, oh man, I'm so sick of this. It's like, yeah, yeah. No, like, I was not. I, you know, the, and those dogs, they didn't ever live for very long because they didn't have immunosuppressant drugs. Um, so eventually it just doesn't work out for all the same reasons that we run into that trouble with organ transplant. Um, but uh the dogs walked around, they, they functioned, they, they, they licked the hands, they ate, they drank. It's very, very strange. The footage is particularly strange. Um, they, 
uh, taxidermied, I think the last one or one of the ones, and you can actually go see the taxidermied version of the original, one of the original two-headed dogs if you go to Russia. I went to Russia, I actually went to Moscow to, uh, yeah. to follow this research up and to find the lab of Vladimir Demikov, who was the physiologist doing that work. So um, yeah, I walked the streets that Dr. White has walked literally um, here in Cleveland and in Minnesota, uh, where he was originally from, and then in Moscow as well. Yeah, that's the other thing. When he was in Moscow, he wasn't scared of anything. He'd go out, they, they yeah, the, Cope the Copex Forum and- so he, Yeah, a, a relatively forum. fearless human being, I think, uh, yeah. in general. The other thing that's interesting that you just said is that the body rejects the new head. It's not the head that rejects the new body. Yeah, the, well, an even stranger point is that White doing a different experiment where he took just the brain, just the brain tissue, and he inserted it into the neck of a dog. So he took one dog's brain out alive using the same technique as the monkey and then put it in the neck skin cavity. It was like a little pouch. Um, and let that dog's body feed the blood to that brain. Okay, there was no rejection. The dog just continued on with the brain in its neck. And White realized that brain tissue is not rejected by the body. So all those Frankenstein movies actually weren't totally wrong. If all you're doing is putting a brain in, the body doesn't reject it because of the blood brain barrier. So that's peculiar when you think about it that way, that the, the brain is literally like invisible to the body, doesn't see it. So it could potentially live on an indefinite period of time in a new place. It's so weird to wrap your... <laughs> <laughs> see, I know it's impossible not to do these puns. It's not, it's not on purpose. You just have to... That must, that, and that must mean something. It does mean the seat of the soul to a certain extent. <laughs> I can't describe it without using the very things I'm describing. Right. But that seems to like obviate. I mean, if you could just dump the brain in, does that obviate the spinal cord problem? I guess it doesn't. No. It doesn't. Well, no, the reason it doesn't is, uh, so one of the things White explained after, because so, he's these are, these are published in major medical journals, this stuff. I mean, it's not, this wasn't done behind a curtain or anything. Uh, well, the, the dog experiments were done behind a curtain, the iron curtain, but the brain experiments on monkeys, those were right out in the open. Um, the, reconnecting nerves is a whole lot more difficult slash yeah. almost impossible than reconnecting vascular system. So that, that was the stall there, but that's actually where the science is today. The, the things that are happening now are on the level of can, what can we do to regrow or reconnect or, you know, the stem cell research is part of that and functional electrical stimulation is part of that. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, neural prosthetics and neural optimization and all these other things. So that stuff's ongoing. I'm following that research myself now I, I, I got hooked, you know, so now <laughs> I chase this information around, but um, that stuff's still happening. So that's why I say, I don't know that the head transplant on its own, we can do it now, but the problem is head transplants a bit analog um, in a world where we might ultimately get beyond the need for some of that work, because we might actually be able to fix things in a very different way. So. Well, in conclusion, two things that kind of, first of all, I can understand your raccoon <laughs> and cemeteries because I love going to cemeteries, but I'm not quite sure about the basements. Yeah, so um, I grew up in an underground house. Uh, we lived in abandoned coal mining land and my parents had bought this kind of a bunker. It was built into the side of the hill. So there were two windows that faced out and everything else was underground. And they bought it thinking they were gonna build something on top of it. But unfortunately, my parents both ended up with uh, really bad illnesses, my mom with cancer and my dad with heart disease. So we just ended up living in the in the bunker itself. So um, I lived underground. Uh, the only one of us who lived above ground was uh, we had a black snake that lived in the attic. So he was in the penthouse and the rest of us were underground. And he kept the mice population down, which was good because my cat was useless. So uh, that's where we lived. And I was near a cemetery and I used to spend quite a lot of time sitting on cemetery benches and reading about history of medicine, which isn't that strange when you figure you've got a lot of medical catastrophes happening in your family. But somehow I've just never gotten out of basements. Um, I, so I lived in the basement and then uh, death summer code, I end up in the catacombs um, for another article I was writing about the birthing machine. I end up, I go to this guy's house because he supposedly had a copy of one and he, his, he had a museum in his basement 
and I go down into this basement and it is a giant vault like with the big like the bank door thing and as yeah. he's closing it as we walk in and he's shutting it and he's like don't worry if we get locked in here there's three days of air and I was just like oh <laughs> grand you know this is how murder mysteries start um and yeah I, I end up in a lot of basements basements of museums do, digging through arch- I worked in a museum and I was always downstairs in the basement <laughs> digging stuff up out of the archives um the basement of the museum in moscow that i was in looking at these old um bits of equipment that were developed by vladimir demikov so yeah uh i don't even like basements but somehow that's just that seems like part of my job now well given that and given your previous works and and maybe asking you about a potential new one so i'm not saying you tend towards the morbid because it's not morbid at all actually to me but you have this fascination with death mm-hmm. and but at the same time it's, it's somewhat uplifting but I can't explain why I think it's because I don't actually think of uh I don't think of death and dying as as different as separate from our lives and living I mean some of this is probably because I I lived with so much death and dying as a kid I mean I lost a lot of my relatives um, I have seen a person die while I was performing CPR on them. I mean, I've, I've been around it all through our history until the modern age, death was a constant companion and something familiar uh, and preparing for it could sometimes almost be a kind of celebration or even joy. So some of it is that I think, and I, that, by the way, that doesn't mean I don't find it hard when it uh-huh. happens uh, to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose one of my best friends who has terminal cancer and I'm I'm not approaching that with joy, I'm upset. Um, but death is with us. So I think that's some of it. I would call my work, um, it's that I, I tend to investigate the yeah. peculiar, quirky, curious fringes of things. Um, because I, I find that most of us tend to be interested in the results and not as interested in how we got there, but I'm interested in the how we got there because the twists and turns, the labyrinthine quality of research and science and history of how we arrive at the present moments we are today. My Clockwork Futures is a book about dread tech, about how technology um, instigates its own catastrophe. Uh, the invention of the plane is the invention of the plane crash that uh, Paul Virilio said that. So, you know, there's a way in which I'm not adverse to the consequences. I, I like to look at the yin and the yang of things. And so none of my books are sort of down on any of these processes. Um, they all look at them as this is a this is a part of our lives. This is something we can approach. This is something quirky and weird. You didn't know about it. And here's a way in to um, a whole different vista on the subject that you probably never even thought to ask. So th- that's what I like. It's it's the curious. Um, and I, I run uh, the, the Peculiar Book Club, which I'm the host of. Is similar. We we look at books by people like Mary Roach. Uh, th- we have the authors oh, on. I've interviewed so. her three times, and I'm going to interview her on her new book. In- oh so- yeah, fuzz. Yeah. Um. So she comes. She comes on to the book club. So ba- basically, what we do is we allow the readers to have a book club with the authors. So Mary Roach, uh, Carl Zimmer, Lindsay Fitzharris, Sam Keen, uh, Deborah Blount. These are all people that come onto the show with me, and we talk about these books, which. Because it start, started as a joke, because I was like, why is there not like a book club for Morticia Adams fans of nonfiction, right? Not fiction, but but real stuff that's peculiar, fringy, unusual, forgotten. And um, someone said, well, you should start one. And I thought, okay, so that's how that happened. But yeah, I'd say my work is peculiar more than morbid, but I'm not afraid of morbidity either. Yeah, it's funny. I, now I'm kind of pissed off because I wanted to, I was thinking about Mary Roach before. I wish I had said it first. So then you could say, oh. <laughs> Uh, but I'm really looking forward to fuzz. And every time I talk to her, I kind of like try and get her angry at me. Sometimes I can. And the last time, <laughs> the last time I said, well, what are you going to write about? Because you've written about all this weird ass stuff, you know? There's and, never uh, a paucity of weird ass stuff in the and world. And I, I said, why don't, why don't you write one about the brain? I did say that to her. Um, but it's funny because you've used the word peculiar, I think six or seven times now. And, and even though I ask you why you do things, now I understand it's because you like the peculiar. Yeah, because, you know, life is more interesting at the intersections and I'm kind of an adventurer at the intersections. So, um, you know, I have collectively worked in an English department, a history department and an anthropology department. Then I left academia altogether. I run a medical humanities journal for BMJ and I'm a freelance writer who writes about everything from stem cells and cloning to prosthetics and brains. 
that on one hand might not look like it all goes together, but it is. It's all under this glorious umbrella of curiosities that um, the same kinds of things that brought me joy when I would go to a museum and be like, oh, I had no idea this existed. Uh, it's like finding a secret bookstore that you, you know, underneath, oh, a, yeah. you know, in a vault under a church or something, uh, which I did, that happened to me in Oxford. <laughs> so we all have a, a desire for wonder. I think we all have a desire for wonder and we miss it as adults. I think as children, we still have it around every corner. There's wonder as adults. We miss it. You know, we spend time looking at the New York times and the economist and, and news that's upsetting and, you know, all sorts of bad things happening in the world. And those are still happening, but there's still a place for wonder in the world. And I think um, looking at peculiar histories, bizarre facts, strange medicine, weird science are ways of reconnecting us to a sense of wonder that this world is still full of things worth discovering. I live right across the street from the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. I know Anna Doty, the curator there. Okay, well, and that was one of the things where I was wondering, should I take my kids there? Should I take my grandkids there? And I go, yeah, yeah, I'll take them there and see the wax lady. Yeah. I mean. I, I actually, I worked at the District Medical History Mu Museum um, for five years in, in Cleveland, so. Yeah, and I see fragments of the bullets that killed the president. Says, yeah, it is peculiar. Yeah, but, but, it, it, but you know, doesn't it turn you into a kid again a little bit? And isn't that something we all kind of need? I think from talking to you, I think we both have that. Yeah, I think we both have that. Yeah, if, I think if you lose that kid-like quality, then if you go to the bar, you're talking to old white men who, <laughs> who play golf and want to talk about mutual funds. Right, oh God. And I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And the day I do that is the day I buy a pair of, a pair of white shoes and a white belt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, socks, socks with your Birkenstocks. Well, that's, um, oh, jeez. My, my partner wears socks with Birkenstocks. <laughs> Are they like knee high? I mean, oh. Uh. Yeah, I, I think I've mostly broken him from it. But. <laughs> Do you think um, the guy that uh, walked in the door? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 my partner. He's, um, At least he was wearing clothes because that happens now with Zoom. Yeah, he was, he was. He was on his way out for a run and I forgot to shut my door. So, that's all right. Yeah. Anyway, this was great. Thank you so much for Thank doing you. It. I really appreciated being here. Um, I think the book strikes people sometimes as uh, like it can't be real, for one thing. But secondly, I think people come at it assuming it's going to be a really dark and macabre tale, and it's not. It's, it's, uh, exactly, it's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's definitely all. about human hope and resilience and um, excitement and adventure, too. Okay, last question. Do you think since you can't get a Nobel Prize after you die, do you think if he was still living, he would have gotten it? I don't know how close he was. I checked to see who won that year um, that he was nominated. Oh, you and in, uh, yeah, and you know, it's possible, but I, I, I really think that perfusion technology, um, therapeutic hypothermia has radically altered medicine in ways that we usually can't appreciate. So I think he might have eventually gotten it, basically built around its practicality and the fact that the Nobel Prize is given for things that really change medicine. And um, do you know they actually keep perfusion kits now on uh, ambulances so that if someone has a heart attack, they can immediately cool the brain so that if you lack oxygen from the heart attack, you won't become brain damaged as a result of the heart attack. So, you know, this is something that's it's like not quite, yeah, it is. I mean, it's not quite as ubiquitous as like the, you know, the paddles that you see everywhere, but this is becoming something that they've realized, oh my gosh. The other thing is that they're, they're starting to realize um, or they're continuing to use it for spinal injuries. They found that if they perfuse really, really early, sometimes they can stop the damage from becoming so bad um, and save people from, you know, paralysis that's, that's worse. So, you know, it, I think it's, it's an important technology. I, I feel that if he hadn't won it that year and he had survived, he may have in fact been nominated again because it's, it's that important. I keep saying I'm done, but oh. <laughs> all right, this is the last last. Last last, okay. Okay, the deal. So I think it's funny how the guy he chose to nominate him, it's all supposed to be secret, but he's telling totally, him. <laughs> and the guy says, you know, let's just keep the monkey stuff <laughs> down low, maybe on the down low. Maybe that's not one of those things we uh, we, we talk about in the acceptance speech. Yeah, let's just do the perfusion and let's just. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I've been really interested to see how the monkey head transplant stuff has attempted, people have attempted to sort of scrub that from his history. 
uh, his colleague, you know, he's been, there are many, many endearing obituaries and other things written about him after he died and how many of them just were like, we just won't, we just, we just won't talk about that. But it was incredibly important to him. Um, and I, I think it's unfair to his memory to think that it wasn't, it was, he, this was something he thought about for a long, long time. Um, but because we're less, um, because it's less acceptable, I guess, now, uh, I noticed that it, a lot of people have preferred to try not to remember him for that. But um, I, don't, I don't think that's fair to him. I, I think that he was, no. that was his, that was one of his legacies. And the saving grace is he wouldn't have cared. I mean, no, you know, he wouldn't have cared. Just like, at all. just like, he'd been like, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay, thanks again, uh, Brandy, for doing this. Uh, and your books, since you know, I'm bookseller. Your books on the front table and in the window. And like I um, said, I'm, I I can have. I'm happy to send you book signed book plates or anything like that. That if you want. Okay, um, I'll talk. I'd, I'll talk to my manager. Maybe we can set that up, and that would be great. I keep these. Um, and you have those, and you don't have the cover of your book. I know. I know. <laughs> but I I do. I sketch little. Um, I put little brains on them. <laughs> little brains and i sign it and i sign okay it, well at so. least you have to send me one yeah, yeah okay let's do it you can oh they're lovely okay lots I'll, of them. I'll either talk to your publicist or i'll email you and we can arrange for that okay all right yeah, those, those ones are going to uh to england for the launch there uh june 10th so. okay and i'll buy a bunch more books <laughs> yay uh, yeah let me know how many you want me to make because it takes forever <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> Um, yeah, I used to be an illustrator for a mag or a, a newspaper, and I yeah. So you do as much as he did. Okay. <laughs> I have not transplanted any heads anywhere. Yeah, in somebody's Scouts basement. I, I think in somebody's basement, you probably have something set up. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Thank Mandy. you. I really appreciate it. Oh, let me know when this goes live too. Okay. Well. All, All right. right. Great. Bye. -bye. Bye.